Okay. Uh, welcome to our September monthly meeting. Um, it's going to be a little shorter version today. Uh, Clyde is traveling. I think he's in Arizona or New Mexico for a wedding. So he's unable to be with us tonight and present his wonderful Bird of the Month presentation. But he promises to be back next month. Uh, that's if he returns back to South Florida after his wonderful stay in the uh, in the in the in the Southwest. Uh, we have some news and special announcements. The Audubon Assembly is back as an in full, full in-person event. Some of you may have attended in the past. Uh, it is taking place in Fort Myers on October 13th through 15th at the Luminary Hotel, great name for a hotel. Um, this year's theme is Birds Tell Us. We'll find out what they tell us, but we know from all the wonderful presentations that we've had, and I'm sure from the presentation we're gonna have tonight, that birds have a, a great deal to tell us. Uh, registration is $135. Uh, the hotel, if you wanna stay there, which is where the uh, uh, assembly will be at is $169. Basically, it is uh, learning sessions, field trips, uh, one field trip actually be at the start and uh, guest speakers and featured speakers. I don't know who they are this year. That has not been announced yet. Uh, However, as a bonus for members of Audubon Everglades, if you are a current member of Audubon Everglades, we will pay $75 towards your registration for the first 10 people who register. So, uh, and all you have to do is go online and register. You can go, uh, Mary will drop that information on the bottom into the chat. And if you will go, if you will register, then send your registration receipt to Luann. Uh, and if you're one of the first 10, you will get $75 toward your registration fee. And uh, of course, you have to go there to get the reimbursement. And all you have to do is see me or send me a selfie with you at the uh, at the assembly. So uh, I look forward to seeing some of you there. And, I, and it should be exciting because we haven't attended one since pre-pandemic. That's 2019. So I'm excited. Uh, Audubon Everglades Eagle Watch, their season is beginning uh, next month. It runs from October through May. Uh, if you would like to become a volunteer and you haven't done this in the past year, uh, you need to get training. And so uh, volunteers uh, basically watch nests for approximately 20 weeks uh, and you visit your nest every two weeks and spend approximately 20 minutes there. Um, and you get to spend some uh, uh, wonderful time watching eagles, learning about eagles, and being part of the wonderful uh, Eagle Watch community that literally runs all through Florida. Uh, Linda McCandless, who is our uh, Audubon Everglades coordinator, has been doing this since 2015. Uh, we are looking for some volunteers if you want to be one. Uh, and if you do, you can contact Linda, and Mary will be putting her email in the Sorry. chat, which is already in. I I've just been informed. Uh, or you can contact the Eagle Watch program manager. And that way you can also uh, uh, get the uh, training. But remember, you must have the training before you can actually become an Eagle, an Eagle Watch volunteer. And if you uh, were one in the past but weren't one recently, uh, it's, they, they ask you to repeat the training again. So Eagle Watch season starts next October. If you want to get involved, get the training. Uh, field trips. We are starting our field trip season again. Oh boy. And we have some good ones coming up. Uh, we have two, we have two be a bird brain, be a bird brain. It's a tongue twister, I guess. Be a bird brain with Professor Screech trips of peaceful waters. Uh, that of course is uh, our own uh, Autumn Coyote, who is what who is our, our our one of our board members, will be leading those trips in the skies, though, of course, is Professor Screech. Uh, this is a family and 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 children friendly field trip. So bring out that child in you. Uh, it's happening on the 9th and on the 11th. And you notice the different times. Uh, on the Friday, it's at 4:30, so it's late afternoon. And on Sunday, it's in the morning at 10 a.m. It starts. Both are at Peaceful Waters. Then we have our second pelagic tour of the year, uh, and that'll be on the 17th. Uh, if you'd like to register for that, and I'll give you that information uh, soon, um, you can do that. Uh, there is quite a fee for that. It's $105, but it's six hours on the ocean, and that, you know, that it's expensive to 
rent a, a charter and bring down uh, four professional tour guides and host them. And so this is going to be quite an experience. There are still 12 spots left. So if you want to register, please do that and you'll get to go out and see ocean birds and, 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 and have experts help you identify them. We also have two of our uh, field trips that are geared towards uh, migrants because uh, they're coming down. They're started, they'll be coming down and they're in October 1st and 2nd. Spanish River at 7.30 on the 1st and Tall Cypress Natural Area, which is in North Broward on Sample Road, and that's on the 2nd. So those are the start of our field trips. There are many, many more. Uh, you can go to the Audubon Everglades calendar at audubonneverglades.org. Just click on calendar. And, or you can go to Eventbrite. And all our trips are now on Eventbrite, and you can register for all of them there. Go to audubonneverglades.org slash Eventbrite slash month. And that is also, Mary's also put that into the chat for you, or about to put that in the chat for you. Okay, uh, volunteer positions. We are looking for a programs coordinator or assistant coordinator. That is someone to e either help run these, the um, not to actually host the monthly meetings, but to be the point person doing all the back end work in terms of helping us to find our presenters and contacting them and making arrangements um, or an assistant coordinator to help us do that work. So we're looking for people to help with programming. Right now it's being done by myself and our, and our vice president and we'd like to share the wealth. So if you're interested in becoming a program coordinator or assistant coordinator, please contact me at info at audubonneverglades.org. Uh, kite production assistance. The kite is going to become a quarterly newsletter slash magazine, and that will begin in December. We're going to a different format, and I think you're really going to love it. Uh, but you'll also be getting monthly updates as you got one on September 1st, letting you know all of the events that are upcoming. Uh, we're looking for community outreach event staffers. Uh, community events are, are happening again, and we need people to help us staff them at our tables. And also plants for birds garden stewards at our Pine Jaw Garden, and also in the future at our garden at uh, Bush Wildlife Sanctuary, which we will be uh, installing uh, in the winter. Okay. Um, we're also, uh, if you'd like to become a member of Audubon Everglades, um, please go to audubonneverglades.org. We are in the 22-23 season, and we'd love for you to be part of our, our membership. Uh, the photography group um, is, is having a meeting. I was just told that you cannot see my screen. Is that correct? Okay, I do. Let me, let me see if I can change that. We can see you. Yeah, we see you. Yeah. But do you see my? Do you see the PowerPoint? Yes, we, we see it now, but we didn't okay. see it before. I am so sorry. I did not know until Mary just informed me. We okay. Because Hubina told Mary, <laughs> we have we have a whole chain of command here. Okay. Uh, so the photography group is meeting this Thursday, and it's a photo share. And although it's too late to submit photos for that event uh, to be able to share them. Uh, you can attend the meeting and see what other people are sharing. I know I'm going to be sharing some of my uh, favorite shots from Iceland, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story behind how I got them. So that is on Thursday at seven o'clock. And if you're interested, um, um, you should have gotten a, a, a email uh, in from the photo photography group, Audubon Everglades photography group. We'll be sending it out again tomorrow. And they'll be sending it out again tomorrow, Mary, just informed me. For, for, one, for those of you wondering who is this mysterious Mary, she's my wife and she's sitting right next to me. Okay, uh, conservation. Uh, not really good news, uh, not bad news. Uh, the a major um, uh, decision was supposed to have taken place at the uh, Palm Beach County Board of County Commissioner meeting on um, August 30th. Uh, where they were going to vote on whether GL Homes would be allowed to swap land uh, in Indian Groves for much more valuable land and much more important land in the Agricultural Reserve, which of course, as many of you know, borders Loxatchee National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the developer, GL Homes, asked for that to be postponed. Uh, we believe either they knew they didn't have the votes on the commission 
or they are having trouble with the water storage feature as part of that deal, which they are offering to develop in the uh, Indian Groves Trail area. Supposedly, the Army Corps, uh, the uh, uh, um, um, the the district, and also the uh, uh, Florida Department of Environmental Conservation all have issues with it. So I think they're trying to straighten out those issues or sweeten the deal. I don't know. But anyway, they asked for a postponement and they got it by a four to three margin. Um, and so they will be back. They'll be back probably in May of 2023. And we may be calling on you to write letters again because this is something that we do not want to see happen. This is a very important area. We want it to stay rural or as rural as possible and be able to be a buffer for the uh, Loxashi National Wildlife Refuge. So stay tuned. Whoops, sorry. Uh, on October 4th, new programs coming up. Uh, we Our next program is Fire Trees, Water, and Everglades Restoration, Conservation Implications for the Florida Swamp Bats, which are really the endangered Florida bonneted bats. Uh, this should be a great presentation. Um, you know, a lot of our presentations, as you know, feature endangered species. Uh, the presenters are, we're going to have two presenters that evening, uh, Dylan Hoyt and Laura Nicholson, both with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. It should be an excellent presentation. I'm looking forward to it. So we hope to see you there on October 4th. All right. And so you can view all our past presentations. This one will be on it as well. And any presentation that we've had in the last couple of years. You can go to our Audubon Everglades YouTube channel and just go to YouTube and type in Audubon Everglades channel and you'll see all our presentations, including our photography club presentations as well. So that's a great place to catch up, to revisit, to catch presentations you may have missed and see some of the wonderful presentations that we've had in the past. So it's that time. If you have any questions or uh, uh, that you would like of our presenter, uh, Dr. George Archibald, uh, please place them into the chat and we will try to get to them as quickly, as often as possible, as quickly as possible and to as many as possible. And I know you guys always ask great questions and I'm sure they'll be uh, uh, challenging for our presenter, but I'm sure he'll also enjoy some of the great questions that you have as well. So without further ado, we're go up, bird of the month, sorry. We're gonna go to our future program and I'm gonna give you uh, Autumn Coyote, who's going to be our board member who will be introducing Dr. George Archibald. Autumn, uh, it's all yours. Thanks, and hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to take a deep breath because I have so much to say about George Archibald, and I don't want to take up any of his time. So pay attention. In 73, in 1973, when many of the cranes were on the brink of extinction, he, along with um, a fellow graduate student, he was in graduate school at the time, established the International Crane Foundation. Um, early on, he pioneered innovative breeding techniques that allowed a whole bunch of rare crane species to reproduce in captivity for the first time, which is awesome. Um, he, th and this is crazy. He forged scientific exchanges and field conservation programs in the 1970s with Chinese and Russian biologists. And back then it was a, a rare occurrence for any Western scientist to do that. Um, and now we know that the Crane Foundation is a highly respected organization, um, but let's go back a little more. Um, he was born in Glasgow, Nova Scotia, Canada. He received his uh, PhD from Cornell are you ready for this? In recognition of his many accomplishments, he has received four honorary doctorates and many awards, more than I can tell you, but I'll give you a few. The gold medal from the World Wildlife Fund, a fellows award from the MacArthur Foundation, the Wildlife Conservation Medal from the Zoological Society of San Diego, the Lilly Medal from the Indianapolis Zoo, and the Douglas H. Pinlot Award from Nature Canada. I'm not done. In 2013, Dr. Archibald was awarded the Order of Canada on behalf of Queen Elizabeth II and received the inaugural Dan W. Lufkin Prize for Environmental Leadership from the National Audubon Society. In now, even with all that, he just completed a book, My Life with the Cranes, a collection of stories. And now I am exhausted. So, <laughs> because that was so much. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. George Archibald and let him tell you about his amazing story.
Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for such a lovely introduction and Autumn, and thank you, Leslie, for inviting me to speak to this group. Uh, tonight, I'm only going to speak about the whooping cranes. Uh, the whooping crane is still the rarest of all cranes, and um, they were reduced to about 15 birds in the migratory flock back in 1941, but they've made a great recovery. They're the tallest bird in North America, standing about five feet tall. And as the lady already mentioned, like most cranes, they have a patch of red on their head. But the whooping crane is unique in that it has a chin strap of bright red skin as well. They are appropriately named because their call sounds like this, whoop. <laughs> And that's the male and the female goes whoop whoop. <laughs> so when they do their unison call or duet together, it sounds like this whoop 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 whoop. And the whoop whoop is the female and the other whoop is the male. And my doctoral work at Cornell was on the evolution of cranes based on a comparison of their calls. They have very fancy inner wing feathers or turtles. Those are not tail feathers raised like a rooster. The tails are short and these tertials are used in display. They have an amazing repertoire of both visual and vocal communication. This is one of their most dramatic displays called the charge threat. And the bird is flapping its wing very rapidly, running forward, ending like this with the wings held back in butterfly fashion. And if you're another crane, this is not good news. It's a way of communicating their aggression because especially on their wintering grounds and on their breeding ground territorial to protect their food. I want to pay tribute to an Audubon guy Robert Porter Allen, who in the 1940s, up until his death in 1963, pioneered work on the conservation of the whooping crane and had these beautiful words, uh, which you can read on the screen. He wrote a book in 1952 called The Whooping Crane. And it was through his efforts on environmental education along the flyway from Texas through Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, Saskatchewan, right up to the boreal forest, meeting with um, local groups, conservation groups, hunters groups. Uh, he really promoted the welfare of the whooping crane and bird by bird, they increased. The colored area in the center indicates the former breeding range in the north and the Crescent in the south is the breeding range in the south. They had both a migratory and a non-migratory population, much as sandhill cranes do today. But their, the greatest numbers were found on these prairies, both in the south and the north. And of course, when Europeans came in the, seventh, in the 18th and 19th century, they devastated those areas. They were very easily developed for farmland. The blue areas indicate the former wintering areas from the Chesapeake Bay to Mexico. And uh, the whooping crane now is reduced to an area, let me see if it will come up, a breeding area just north of the traditional range. There we go. Um, and the breeding area, can you see my mouse on the screen? Maybe you can't, is in that dark green area and they migrate all the way to Texas. But this is, these dots are, um, the blue dots are made, uh, former nesting areas of the whooping crane. Cranes have a very special place in many Native American cultures. This is Lake Superior in the lakes of Northern Wisconsin in a painting done by the Chippewa chiefs 
in 1849. They went to meet with the president of the United States asking that these areas be conserved for their people. And the Crane clan was the leader of the clans and each clan was represented by an animal. And the painting says, we are connected intellectually, the lines from head to head and in our hearts together proposing that this land be protected for our tribes. But of course it wasn't because Europeans were pouring into the continent and if you had your family in that covered wagon and there are no stores to go to, you only depended on the resources that mother nature was providing. So the bison, the elk, the antelope, the trumpeter swans, the, the prairie chickens, the turkeys, the, the, even the geese were obliterated on the great plains of North America. And there's been quite a recovery in, in the last century. The birds were simply killed because the people had to eat and a big bird was a big meal. Fortunately, in the far north of Canada, one tiny population of whooping cranes survived. This is the population that Robert Porter Allen studied on the wintering grounds in Texas and along their migration route. But it wasn't until 1954 that the breeding ground was discovered by accident during a forest fire survey. This is a huge, huge expanse of wetland in one of Canada's largest national parks. And each pair of whooping cranes defends a large territory, many hundreds of acres of shallow wetland where they build their nest, both male and female assist in building the nest and in incubation and in lavishing care on their young. Like most cranes, whooping cranes only lay two eggs a year and only rear one chick every few years. There's a great mortality of the chicks, but they're long lived birds. We've had whooping cranes live to be over 40 years of age in captivity. And if each pair can produce two or three young successfully in their lifetime, the population can slowly increase. So they migrate as family groups and in small flocks of non-breeders. Saskatchewan is their major staging area in autumn. They fly across the boreal forest. There's very little food for them there until they get to the wheat fields of Saskatchewan. And they'll spend as much as a month there and then head off for the coastal marshes of Texas. The distance flown in one day by this bird that was monitored using radio telemetry are indicated by the circles. You can see in a single flight, they went across the Dakotas. They, they fly, they leave the fields in late morning when the thermals are active and they climb to great altitudes, maybe four or 5,000 feet. And then they glide uh, pushed south by tailwinds and they fly in a straight line towards their final destination. But in late afternoon or early evening, they look for a place to spend the night. And it could be one of these little ponds along their migration route. There's no telling where the family might land to spend the night. In the morning, they may wait for the thermals before taking off again. But uh, we think in cranes, they may not eat a lot during the, the real push of their migration. They build up their fat reserves at their staging area in the north before they migrate. And then they use that fat uh, for energy to get them south. I suppose if they ate a lot during the migration, that added weight would not help them. So there's be a typical pond on which a pair of whooping cranes spend the night during migration. Finally, they get to this beautiful coastal area 
the main wintering area is the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, right on the coast with the intercoastal canal going through it, very near Corpus Christi in Texas. This is where Dr. Robert Porter Allen did a lot of his research. They love to be in shallow water in the winter, unlike sandhill cranes, which will gather in big flocks and feed on waste grain in agricultural areas. The whooping cranes in this migratory flock that come to Texas prefer to defend a huge area of wetland in which they predominantly eat blue crabs and wolfberries. And throughout the day, they are walking around in their territory searching for these food items. And because crabs apparently are limited, they have to defend their territory against the intrusion of other cranes, which they do through charge threats and unison calls. And by being white, by being white, they can be seen for great distances. This is their favorite food. And here are two pairs with their red expanded on the very border of their territory, threatening each other. Don't take another step. This is the charge threat of a whooping crane communicating to a neighboring pair of whooping cranes. He's flying in a very rigid manner. With each wing beat, there's a large crackling sound, crack sound and he lands with the red exposed to the other cranes with this huge, strong beat of his wings and uh, keeps shooting that red towards the other cranes, holding his wings back in what we call the butterfly threat display, which continues sometimes for several seconds. So the Blackjack Peninsula uh, was the, or is the major wintering area for the whooping cranes within the natu uh, Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, through the years, the number of cranes has increased. When Robert Porter Allen did his work, there were only 15 birds, maybe three or four pairs. And each of these, square air, air units in red indicate the territory of, of a pair of birds. So by 1971, there were 59 individuals on 17 territories and so on. And this is 1985, you can see they're spreading out to San Jose Island, which is privately owned by the Bass family and to Matagorda Island, which eventually became part of the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. The International Crane Foundation has an office near the Aransas Refuge now, and we have four employees down there. And we're working with private landowners that border the protected areas for the whooping cranes, because more and more as the population increases, they're moving into these neighboring areas. And our problem, our big concern now is sea level rise because you see all of these wintering areas are right on the border of the Caribbean Sea. And th they feed in the shallow water for the crabs and these wetlands are bordered by brushy areas. So if the water level increases, the whooping cranes may not be able to reach their food. So uh, protecting upland areas nearby is important because the wetlands may have to move into those surrounding areas. You'll notice every 10 years there's a dip in their population and that is correlated directly with the rabbit cycle, which is a 10 year cycle in Wood Buffalo National Park. And if there's an abundance of rabbits, there's less pressure on pre-fledged whooping cranes or adult whooping cranes because they go flightless every second or third year and lose all their flight feathers on the breeding grounds and could be more easily taken by a predator. 
very interesting relationship. So in summary, we have a spring migration from the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge north to Wood Buffalo National Park. They lay their eggs in late May. It takes the juveniles about three months before they can fly. The family unit stays together and they come to the Aransas Refuge where we hope that at least 10 to 12% of the population will be juvenile cranes. By counting the cranes in the winter, in early winter, you see the juveniles have a lot of brown feathers. We can tell how many chicks have been produced. And in the spring, the chicks have turned white and we know how many birds leave in the spring. And uh, this way we've been able to come up with the figures that in one year, we lose 8% of our whooping cranes through natural mortalities or whatever. And we have a gain usually of 10 to 12%. So we have a profit margin there of two to 4%. So it's a slow increase. If you'd like to see the whooping cranes from the little town of Rockport, Texas, these boats go out every day from November through March and you can see the whooping cranes at close range. They absolutely ignore these boats. They're acclimated to the boats going up and down the intercoastal canal every day. And that's wonderful for bird watchers, but it's a great risk to the cranes because there are barges filled with poison chemicals going from the factories to the distilleries and so on along the coast of Texas. And should there be an accident, we could lose a lot of our birds. We have a whooping crane festival in late February every year. And we invite you to come and join us. It's the last week in February. We have boat trips out to see the whoopers. We have talks by crane experts and other conservation groups. And as I mentioned, our big concern is climate change and the impact not only on the wintering grounds of the whooping cranes, but on the breeding grounds. Because at Wood Buffalo National Park, many of the wetlands are perched on permafrost. And if the permafrost melts, the wetlands disappear, uh, appearing and flooding other areas uh, in neighboring areas. So it's a very complex interaction. Uh, one that is having huge impacts on black neck cranes in Tibet and on Siberian cranes on the tundra of Russia. So this is some, something that the Crane Foundation researchers and our colleagues in these areas are monitoring very closely. We have the Endangered Species Act of 1973, which protects the birds as individuals, but also their key habitats. And this has been a very, very important act in the welfare of the whooping cranes. So um, I'm going to talk to you about reintroduction programs to help the whooping cranes. And back in the 1960s, the US and Canadian governments decided to collect one egg from each whooping crane nest and transport them by air to the, Arans uh, to the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in Maryland. And that was the start of a captive flock. Here is the Patuxent area in the east. And until a few years ago, the population of whooping cranes at Patuxent was very, very important in the starting of experimental populations. Baraboo in Wisconsin is where I live. That's the home of the whooping cranes. And you'll see some stars, one on the Kissimmee Prairie in Texas, a whooping crane reintroduction was planned there. Another one before that was planned at Grays Lake National Wildlife Refuge, but both of those experiments failed. I'm going to explain what happened and about the continuing efforts. Whooping cranes breed very well in captivity 
we collect the eggs and can get maybe four to six eggs from each pair in one year rather than just two. In 1989, the Patuxent flock was divided. The birds were crated and on a C-130 Army transport plane, they were taken to Baraboo, Wisconsin. So we have been breeding them ever since 1989 at the International Crane Foundation. And when Patuxent was closed three years ago, ICF was given the responsibility of finding homes for 70 whooping cranes at Patuxent. And now there are five other breeding centers with whooping cranes. They include the Smithsonian Center in Virginia, the White Oak Plantation in near Jacksonville, Florida, the New Orleans Zoo and their conservation center just outside New Orleans, the Dallas Zoo, and the Calgary Zoo in Canada. We have about 150 whooping cranes in captivity. And from these birds, eggs and chicks are produced for the reintroduction programs. This is a facility we call Crane City at the International Crane Foundation. It has four streets and 61 crane dominiums. And each pair of cranes have two pens so we can rotate them to keep, keep the soil clean. And every day our people check all the cranes, change their water buckets so they have fresh water, clean out their little swimming pools and uh, wading pools and so on. And what it looks like this. And whooping cranes are extremely cold hardy birds. They arrive back on their breeding grounds um, in Canada when it's still very, very cold in the spring. And our birds start laying usually in April. This bird is sitting on its eggs during its snowstorm. And Here's a pair with their little pond and another pair with a big nest built in the water. Now, as I mentioned, the little chick or chicks follow their parents about and the parents are always looking for food for these little birds. And perhaps the first thing this little crane sees is that beautiful head of the mother crane coming down to offer it an insect or a tiny fish on the nest on its first glimpse of the world. Well, a researcher at the Crane Foundation named Rob Horwich developed a technique of rearing the cranes so that they know their cranes, they don't become imprinted on people we call this costume rearing using costume people and puppets, hand puppets. These people do not speak to the cranes. They have a tape recorder with the various calls of the cranes and they can take them into wetlands and um, find food for them. The, the chicks learn to forage in the natural habitat. As I mentioned, juvenile cranes stay with their parents for about nine months. So these chicks follow the costumed people around as well. So this is our facility, our headquarters in Wisconsin. And now we want to bring these cranes that are raised by costumes or raised by their parents in captivity and get them back into the wild. I welcome you to visit the Crane Foundation. We're open from the middle of April to through the end of October. We have beautiful exhibits and you can learn about all 15 species of cranes and what we are doing around the world to help each of them. Here's the whooping crane exhibit and the whooping cranes are dancing. The first experiment was to start a migratory flock between Idaho and New Mexico. This started in 1975 and it did not include the Crane Foundation. We were just hatched in 1973 and it wasn't until 1989 that we became involved in the whooping cranes. 
This shaded area is Idaho, a major breeding area for greater sandhill cranes that migrate across Colorado to winter in New Mexico at the Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge. Gray's Lake National Wildlife Refuge in Idaho, not so far from Jackson Hole, is a major breeding area for these cranes. And a wonderful guy named Broad Druin did his doctorate studying the sandhill cranes in this area. And he proposed substituting whooping crane eggs into the sandhill crane nests. So between 1975 and 1986, uh, one, uh, 289 whooping crane eggs were substituted into 289 nests of the sandhill crane. And the sandhill eggs were taken to Patuxent for research on diet and rearing techniques and so on. The sandhill crane is a very successful crane. It's the most abundant of the cranes. We think that they may number, if you look at all the different subspecies, maybe 1.5 million birds. They paint their feathers with mud in the spring and it stains them this beautiful russet color. This helps them hide on their nests. In contrast, the whooping cranes are white. They want to be obvious on their nests. They nest in the huge wetlands far from terrestrial predators. But the sandhill crane can fit into a much smaller landscape. Okay. Something is wrong. There we go. Here's Dr. Druin putting a whooping crane egg out at Gray's Lake. The young whooping crane, now banded, they put radios on them so they could follow them. The whooping cranes followed their foster parents to Bosque del Apache. They spent the winter together and they moved into upland habitats and fed with the sandhill cranes. They didn't need blue crabs at all, feeding on waste wheat and corn and so on. And in the spring, they migrated back to Gray's Lake and nearby areas. The whooping cranes often saw each other. There were 65 birds, I believe, that made the migration to New Mexico but they were sexually imprinted on sandhill cranes and courted sandhills, not whooping cranes. So we didn't have a single pair of whooping cranes formed and the experiment was discontinued. But we learned a great deal. We learned that migration is learned in cranes. We learned that they could feed in upland areas like sandhill cranes. And we learned how important the uh, imprinting is in cranes. So there were 289 eggs and 84 birds fledged and there was no pairing with whooping cranes. So that was a huge disappointment. Then release number two, this started in the early nineties in Florida we wanted to start a non-migratory flock. Now, whooping cranes never nested in Florida, as far as we know. They nested on the great grasslands of southwestern Louisiana that, that extended into Texas. But the, the whooping crane recovery team, which is a group of specialists from Canada and the US that advise the government about what to do, we're afraid to put whooping cranes back in Louisiana because they might join up with the Aransas flock and attract them to Louisiana, which would not be a healthy thing for the continued increase of the Aransas flock. So Florida was selected and by coincidence, 289 eggs of whooping cranes were planted in the sandhill nests in Idaho and the same number of young cranes reared in captivity at Patuxent and now at ICF were released in Florida. But that started in 19, 
93, but by 2009, only 10 chicks had fledged, which is far below the number required for a sustainable, sustainable population. So that experiment was discontinued. This is the release pen where the captive reared birds would spend about two weeks before the flight netting was removed and they could move out into the farmland and the wetlands of the Kissimmee Prairie. This formed up beautifully. The captive reared birds were reared by their parents in captivity or by the costume pe people. And there was no difference in the rate of pairing between birds that were raised by people that were costumed and birds that were reared by normal cranes. They showed no interest in pairing with sandhill cranes. So why wasn't the experiment a success? Sandhill cranes are very tame in Florida. Many of you have seen them at close range, I'm sure. This is a wild crane being fed, fed by a friend of mine. And the whooping cranes, we thought they're going to become tame in Florida too and thrive just like the sandhill cranes. Here's a pair of whooping cranes developing mating behavior. The male has to stand on the female's back. He fell off and he tries again and he fell off, I think, yeah. Okay, here he's trying again. Uh, in captivity, we have to clip the wings of the cranes. This one is successful, I think. Yes, it is. Okay. And uh, sometimes they don't copulate properly because their wings are clipped. We don't want them to fly up into the flight netting. And uh, they don't copulate properly, so we have to do artificial insemination. So the cranes were breeding. They were making nests in Florida. But so many of the males died by colliding with power lines. A, a whooping crane male will fly around their territory driving away sandhill cranes or other whooping cranes. And when there's poor light, they would collide with wires. And there's so much development in Florida that some of our best pairs, the males were killed. Uh, and the females would have to go look for a new male. And soon we had an overabundance of females and so on. So that was one problem. Another problem, the cranes go flightless. And there were cycles of drought in Florida in which many of the wetlands dry up. You'll notice this bird on the left, it's flightlessly gone. And for six weeks, that bird can't fly. So as the wetlands decline, the Alligators are concentrated, the bobcats and the coyotes and so on can more easily catch these flightless whooping cranes. So we had a very high mortality of the cranes too. So that experiment was stopped because they simply weren't producing enough uh, juveniles. So we started in 2001, efforts to start a migratory flock of birds that were reared properly, they were imprinted properly between Wisconsin, which sort of bordered the great grasslands. We had a lot of prairies in Southern Wisconsin, but they're mostly developed into farmland and cities. So a refuge in the center of Wisconsin, the Cedar National Wildlife Refuge, was selected. And this enclosure is for birds produced at ICF and at Patuxent. It includes a large pen out in the water. That's where we trained the birds to roost at night so they would roost in the water away from predators. And the small pens is where they were fed and managed. And in front of it is a runway. And we worked with a group from Canada called Operation Migration to teach these cranes to fly to Florida by following ultralight aircraft. And we're very grateful to our colleagues from Operation Migration. 
they raise a million dollars a year from the various contributors to do these migrations. And they would go to the captive breeding centers first when the chicks were very young and teach them to follow the, the trike, the machine that's going to become an ultralight aircraft when they attach wings to it. And then they would train the birds. These cranes just don't take off. It takes them a long time to develop their flight skills, uh, weeks actually, before they're strong enough to take a long migration. So this training continued and finally the birds would fly from Wisconsin step-by-step step, flying in the early morning before there's a breath of wind when it's much, much safer when the birds are flying around this machine uh, to get down to the Chazahuitska National Wildlife Refuge and the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge near Tallahassee. Now the birds would spend the winter there in an enclosure that they could fly in and out from. And humans had very little contact with them, would just observe them from blinds. But they would make sure they put on the costume to make sure that the juveniles would get back into the roosting enclosure at night. And this shows their migration uh, between Wisconsin they flew back to Wisconsin on their own. They had learned the migration route. And they paired up and they nested. There's a nest in a beautiful wetland. But we had a big problem in Wisconsin. In late April, in this very, very pristine area called Nesita Refuge, it's the perfect habitat for a type of black fly that's an avian predator. And they would hatch during the whooping crane's third week of incubation. And they would swarm the whooping cranes and drive them from the nest. We had one pair raise two chicks in 2006. And we were so encouraged about this. But after that, here they are with their two chicks. And here they are in Florida with the chick that they raised. But here are the black flies attacking the whooping crane. And the whooping crane would stand up and these black flies would come and land on the eggs, absolutely cover the eggs. And the bird would sit down. And then of course, it was a direct hit to their bare brood patch. And the cranes would immediately leave the nest and run around very, very upset, trying to get rid of these uh, blood sucking insects. We've corrected this problem to some extent by collecting the first clutch of eggs and allowing the cranes to recycle and the black flies hatch and they don't, the cranes have not recycled until the populations of the black flies have declined. And we've been able to get some more productivity by doing this type of management. And then we use those eggs that are collected. We raise them in captivity for release back into the wild. So we've had a lot of breeding in Wisconsin, but again, we have the problem with predation. Uh, this year, for example, we had, I think about 16 chicks hatch under pairs in the wild here in Wisconsin, but I believe only two or three have survived to fledge. And it's because of, we believe predominantly because of predation, perhaps from coyotes and from raccoons and maybe some from bald eagles. But it's very, very difficult to tell that you're, they're out in these big marshes and the chicks just disappear. We have about 75 birds now in this new population. But although we led them to Florida, they've elected to shortstop. And the major wintering area is in Southern Indiana at Goose Lake State Wildlife Reserve and in Northern Alabama at Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge. A few birds come to Florida, but very few. So 
we are dealing now with this predation problem in Wisconsin. And if we can solve that somehow, and I don't know how, maybe our, if we have all these chicks hatching, if we can get them to survive somehow, uh, maybe that population will be successful. Well, in 2010, we started experiment number four in southwestern Louisiana. The whooping crane recovery team observed that the birds reared in Florida and released in Florida in experiment number two actually did not range far from the release area on the Kissimmee Prairie. So the recovery team was comfortable with starting a flock in Louisiana because we thought they'll stay in Louisiana and they won't uh, interrupt the migratory flock. Well, this is a fascinating area. This is the Mississippi River Delta on the right and the coastal wetlands on the left. And that shaded area above the coastal wetlands on the left is what we call the former Kissimmee Prairie. It was a big prairie that extended as far, far west of Houston. And the top block is basically the Kissimmee Prairie and the big block at the bottom are the wetlands that are still intact. Uh, some of them are freshwater, some of them are tidal. But some of the largest wetlands here in North America are those tidal wetlands in Louisiana. And this, these two areas were a major breeding area for the whooping crane before settlement. Here's another uh, diagram of the Kissimmee, uh, or not the Kissimmee, the Cajun Prairie complex. That's the border of Louisiana on the left, but that prairie went all the way into Texas to not indicated in this diagram. At the bottom, you'll see White Lake and White Lake was where the last pair of whooping cranes were observed breeding in the wild in 1939 by this guy, John Lynch, who worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And from his air survey, he looked down and saw a pair with two juveniles. And this year, 2022, one of our pairs in Louisiana nested at White Lake and fledged two chicks, which was just extraordinary. We had eight chicks fledge in the wild in Louisiana this year. These wetlands in southwestern Louisiana are absolutely amazing. Those white dots, each white dot is a white ibis at their nest. This is one of the major colonies along the coast. Then inland, we have a landscape that's been transformed by agriculture. And these are crayfish ponds bordered by rice fields, bordered by pastures, and they have a very complex rotation system of these three different types of agriculture. And the whooping cranes discovered soon after release at White Lake, our captive reared birds, that there was a lot more food in the crayfish ponds than in the natural wetlands. So those little dots above the Southern area those are crayfish fields for, uh, filmed from the satellite. And the, the red area is the White Lake area where we're releasing our birds. Our first release site was at the White Lake area in Louisiana. And here is the complex that's managed by the state. And those squares indicate where our release pins were. And uh, there were, 20,000 acres of ag land in the north. That's the intercoastal canal going along there. And 50,000 acres of fresh water marsh. These are not impacted only in hurricanes uh, from the salt water. And it's divided into another of compounds. Now what happened? I've lost my program. Hmm. 
I'm okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. I don't know what happened. My my screen went off. I'll go back to share screen here. Yeah, try try to start over. Or it'll go where you left off. I think it's gone. It's not there. But oh. I'm almost at the end of my talk. So can I go back and just talk to people from Of course. From the screen. Okay. Can you all see me? I'm almost at the end of my talk. Think I don't know what happened. I never trust technology. But um, we have about 75 birds now in the Louisiana flock. And we had eight chicks produced and fledged this year, which is uh, the most we've ever had uh, fledged in the year in Louisiana. And we are very hopeful that this reintroduction prog program will be successful there. So, um, we're hoping there's been talk in the news of delisting the whooping crane. The International Crane Foundation does not support that considering all the threats that this still impacting the whooping cranes with sea level rise and loss of permafrost. And the fact that our experimental populations are not yet self-sustaining. So uh, we're hoping that uh, full protection will continue to be provided for the whooping cranes and federal support and so on for this continued recovery effort. And that's really the end of my talk. So if people have questions about the whooping cranes, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And finally, I'd like to invite you again to come up to Wisconsin to visit our headquarters and uh, see whooping cranes in the wild. We have one pair nesting in the wild very near our headquarters. And uh, I would welcome your visit. Great, that was, that was really great. I, I learned a lot of stuff that I didn't know and there's a bunch of questions in the, in the chat. And if you guys have questions, please put them in the chat. I will ask them. We're going to go way back, way back in your presentation um, when you were talking about how the, the cranes go flightless. And Chris Golio wants to know um, if you would clarify the relationship between the amount of rabbits and, and the birds. Oh, OK. <laughs> First of all, it's a guess because it's very, very difficult to get data in the field because of accessibility and you just can't see what's going on. It's a huge, huge flat area where all this is happening. But the researchers in Canada have monitored these populations of rabbits, which is pretty easy to do with traps and statistics. And the major predators on the rabbits up there are wolves wolverines and lynx. And when the rabbit population crashes, uh, these predators uh, perhaps are killing whooping cranes and that's why we have a drop in the population uh, when there, there are fewer rabbits for these predators. But we don't have firm data, it's circumstantial connection, but I think it makes sense because it's happened repeatedly with these 10 year cycles. <laughs> so it seems like it seems like a logical connection. Yeah. Um, I think some of these questions you answered in the course of your program, let's see. Um, someone, this is just a nice comment. Someone said they live in Rockport. Uh, this is Patton White. Uh, the cranes have a real hold on the public and I love to watch people cry when they see their first ones. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's really just a nice vision. Um, so, oh, this is interesting. Julian Norris asks if only, if there were only 15 birds at one point, is genetic diversity limited? Is it a problem? Well, a lot of people predict people predicted that the whooping crane would not survive because of inbreeding depression, but they are producing very, very well. Uh, when I think about the whooping cranes, I think that those survivors, those 15 birds uh, are the survivors. 
and they likely were of excellent genetic quality. And uh, because of that, they were able to continue to survive despite the inbreeding uh, potential problem. Uh, if you have a large population of birds or say just if you think about humans, if you have thousands of people watching a football game and you were to pick 15 randomly from the observers and put them on an island to start the human race, you might have an inbreeding problem. <laughs> but if you picked uh, 15 athletes and put them on an island, uh, it might be a different story. So I think that those survivors were like the strong athletes of their kind. That's really interesting. Um, do we know um, how many year, do you have any idea how many year round whooping cranes are in Florida? Yeah, it's, uh, I think we have maybe six or seven right now. And we've been capturing them, my colleagues in Florida have been capturing them and bringing them to Louisiana to put with the flock over there. But they're not that easy to capture. <laughs> and I know of two females that have been captured and one of them is paired up with a Louisiana male. Most of the birds in Florida are females, I believe. And some of them are very old now, but we're hoping they can contribute to the Louisiana flock. Well, speaking of like capturing them, are there untagged whooping cranes in the wild? Uh, yeah, uh, some of the birds, I, th I think possibly one or two of the birds that were reared in the wild in Florida were not banded or their bands fell off after some years. But most of them are banded. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and Scott has a, has a good question. He wants to know, is there anything organizations like Audubon Everglades uh, or individuals can do to discourage US Fish and Wildlife from downlisting the whooping crane? Sure, your Audubon chapter could write a letter to the, you know, respond to the thing that they put in the federal register about the proposed downlisting and express your concerns. And if you want, wanted me to help you with that letter, I'd be very happy to. Oh, absolutely, we would love that. That's a great offer. And I'm sure everybody that's here tonight would be really happy with that. Um, so yeah, so we'll talk later. Um, <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, how, oh, this is good too. This is also from Scott. He wants to know, how do you see the ramifications associated with climate change affecting the whooping cranes? <clears throat> well, I've already described that the sea level rise, making the coastal wetlands too deep for the whooping cranes to feed in mm. and loss of breeding habitat by the melting of permafrost. Yeah, let me see. Does, eh, I think I, oh, did I hit everybody's question? Does anybody else have a question for George? Wow, that's, oh wait, we got one. <laughs> oh, we're, everyone wants to thank, uh, Shuri wants to thank you for your contribution to conservation and education. Um, and also the fact that you think outside the box to have this success for the cranes. Um, oh, Kevin Baker wants to know, was there any attempt to change their diet? Yeah. Uh, in in uh, 2008 through, through 2010, there was a drought in Texas and 21 whooping cranes starved to death at the Aransas Refuge because the wetlands dried up and they didn't have any food or not, not enough food. But three pairs of them migrated inland to a reservoir near Austin, Texas. They roosted in the water of this reservoir at night. And during the day, they went into the cornfields and the pastures and they fed with the sandhill cranes. Huh. Two of the pairs had the juvenile and they all survived. 
And wow. in recent years, there have been two pairs of whooping cranes wintering west of Houston near a little village called Garwood. And there's a big waterfowl hunting area there. Even sandhill cranes are hunted. But the manager of that whole program, the hunters over there, is a conservationist. And he educated the hunters about the whooping cranes. And in the midst of all this hunting, in an inland area with the birds feeding in agricultural fields, rice fields predominantly, they've survived, they've done really well. So we are very encouraged by that and by the fact that this Eastern population of migratory whooping cranes did not want to come to coastal Florida to feed on blue crabs. They preferred to stay and feed in agricultural fields in Indiana and in Alabama. So, the bird is more flexible than we thought, and that's good news. Yeah, um, you're getting a ton. You're getting a ton of thank yous and great presentations. Um, what, going back to um, going back to when you were speaking about the the male cranes flying into the wires. Why is it why why is it that uh, Martin wants to know why is it the males die from the electrical wires and not the females? Occasionally, the females uh, collide as well, but the, the role of the male crane is to fly around his territory, which may be hundreds of acres of wetland and agricultural fields and whatever, and chase away other cranes. And just because he has more flight hours than the female who stands around looking after the chicks or the nest, uh, he's more prone to collision. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an odds game. Yeah. <laughs> no, poor guys. Um, sure. Even more compliments are coming in. I can't even read all these compliments. Um, does, I don't think, do we have, oh, someone wants to know, did you collaborate with anyone on your, on your book? Oh, yes, I did. Um, the librarian at the Crane Foundation, a marvelous lady named Betsy Diedrichsen, has a great eye for design and text. And I wrote all these essays and she threw out about 80% <laughs> of the text and boiled it down to the essence. So it's just a series of short stories about my adventures in various countries. And uh, I'm very grateful to Betsy for her help. Yeah, oh, thank she you, Betsy. Wonderful editor. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if there are no other questions, I think we've got one last thank you from Sabina and Mark Cook um, uh, for a wonderful program and your work with the cranes. And oh, thanks to Leslie for making this all happen. Um, can you tell us the name of your book one more time? My Life with Cranes. <laughs> My Life with Cranes. That's an easy one to remember. All right, Scott, I am going to turn it back over to you. And, uh, and thanks so much, George. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, George. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, very informative. And uh, I will take you up on your offer to help us with that letter uh, so that our organization can send to um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I will also bring it up at our Florida chapters meetings for other chapters to do the same. Uh, and okay. maybe we can get a movement happening in Florida to um, discourage U.S. Fish and Wildlife from downlisting the cranes. Thank you. So uh, we have, um, uh, we're coming to an end of our program. Uh, it's always uh, kind of the sad point of the night, but I want you to join us again on October 4th uh, uh, for uh, Dylan Hoyt and Laura Nicholson, who'll be talking about the endangered Florida bonded bats. And I know you'll love that presentation. Uh, uh, the bonded bats, as, you, as some of you may know, are being threatened in uh, one of their chief areas, which is in uh, the Miami area near the Miami Zoo, where they are threatening to build a, a, a water park. And uh, that's a fight that's ongoing currently. And we're hoping that that does not happen. But this is what um, many of our species are facing is, is fights with um, developmental areas. 
uh, and hopefully that will be defeated. Anyway, maybe we'll learn more from Dylan and Laura next week. I mean, excuse me, next month. And until then, I'd like to thank you once again for joining us tonight and bid you a wonderful evening and a wonderful month and start getting out on some of those field trips because they're starting to happen. I'm sure you'll enjoy them and I hope to see you there. And I hope to see some of you at the Audubon Assembly as well. Uh, remember, if you're one of the first 10 people and you send in your information to uh, Luann, Luann at AudubonEverglades.org, uh, that uh, you will be able to get $75 as long as you're a member of Audubon Everglades and you attend the conference. Okay, have a wonderful evening, everybody. See you next month. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Peyton, I see that you're still on. Um, if you can, if you want to unmute yourself for a second, uh, it's so delightful that you're getting to see the whipping cranes where you are currently. Oh, it's really wild to watch people. And yeah. they're really spreading. I mean, when I've just in the three years I've been here, there's they need more space because there are more of them. Oh. And you see them 15 miles south of where you saw them three years ago. That's great. That's great. So I'm it's glad. Really I mean, it's still the same type of uh, area, the marshlands and stuff, but much further south than they were, almost to uh, Corpus Christi. And wow. I'm forty and I'm forty five minutes north of Corpus Christi, and they're ten minutes north of me. So they've gone a good a good distance. That's wonderful. That's so wonderful that you're getting to, you know, like you 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 went from our cranes to the whipping cranes. That's great. That's great. Right. I've had two really cool birding experiences in the last couple of days. Rockport is one of the biggest places for the hummingbirds, and we have a huge festival that draws about five thousand people. Wow. And our and our and our whole uh, county has less than twelve thousand. So you know that people are coming from all over and they close the school down for parking and stuff. Well, they started to come in. Now, I don't have that many today, but the other morning when I had a couple of people when we were having breakfast outside, we could not count them, but we know that in my front yard, there were more than 75. Uh, oh my I gosh. Have, I have, just in my front yard, I have eight feeders up. And it, it, is, it was just wild. It was like watching fireworks. That was really well, cool. Well, don't tell too many people from Florida that we're all going to want to come visit. Oh, well, everybody's <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I mean, today I probably don't have more than 20 in the front yard, but it was just amazing. That's so, wonderful. Birding so, here has been really good. I'm so glad that you're having those experiences there. And we miss you, of course. I miss being, I miss coming back too. I mean, you know, it's, it, everything's a toss up in life. It's, you gain something and you lose it. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. He was wonderful. Yes, wasn't he? Yeah, a very, 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 very knowledgeable and very delightful and very committed. Been running that foundation that for for, for fifty years. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really. I was um, lucky enough this last. It, had, it was Thanksgiving weekend actually because I got stuck. I was stuck. Where the humming, where the uh, cranes were meant to be coming in, but they had, only four had arrived in our area. We're, I'm not, I'm not actually part of the preserve or the National Wildlife Refuge. I, I'm further south, although it's the same county. And I was stuck, and I was waiting for a tow truck, and a pair and their baby came in. It was that pair's first baby, and it, I mean, it, it really is exciting. And you watch people actually get out of the cars with tears streaming down their faces um you know because it's just such an iconic bird of course of course any of us that are old you know remember when it, every time there was a baby that survived and it was an exciting event and it was in the newspapers and stuff so it was really cool so how friendly how friendly are they are they not, still, not. they're not they're not so you you're you're not going to get up close to them like you do to uh 
our cranes. Oh, not not a cranes. not a prayer. But you know what he was saying? They don't get along with the sandal cranes. But here they do. That the sandal cranes are in among them all the time. Uh, that's interesting. And we have a lot of sandal cranes today. I had uh, ten marble godwits uh, that landed at the beach while I was having lunch. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. What treats? What treats? It is great. Wonderful. Um, and I'm, I was talking to Linda earlier and I was telling her what a fabulous job you are doing. I am so proud. Are you going to get a conservation award this year? Uh, I haven't asked for one. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I, I so think you deserve it. For, uh, I just, yeah, the, the, the problem is it's a self-nomination process, you know, and I'm not going to nominate, you know, myself or anything. So, I mean, I may, I may put the organization in for something. I don't know. I'll, I'm thinking about it. I still have another week and a half. Uh, so, but I'm not going to put myself up for anything. I, I wouldn't do that. But anyway, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's great talking to you, Peyton. Uh, well, you know, I told, um, oh, who's. Who do we deal with? Um, Jackie. Jackie. Sula. Yes, Sula. Years ago, that I didn't feel our job would be complete until we won the conservation award as a, as an organization. Yeah. And maybe I'll just send her a note. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, Peyton. <laughs> I think I will. I'll, okay. I'll move this process along a little. It may okay. not work, but I certainly think you've done an amazing job. Well, thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Good night. Uh, good night, Peyton. Oh. Good night, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting. Bye, oh, everyone. I've, we've been on this whole time? We have? Oh, I'm so embarrassed. That's okay. There's only there's only like 20 people on, so it's okay. Oh, I just thought it was the two of us. No, no, no. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. Oh. No worries. Sorry, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Take care of yourselves. I got to get out of here, and I can't. There I am.